everyone, it's Patricia, and you're listening to another episode of the Bad Chinese Teacher podcast. i um, recording this on a Tuesday, so the Model Congress episode just came out yesterday. If you haven't listened to that yet, go ahead and take a listen to that. That one's a really fun one. I had like five of my high school friends over to talk about Model Congress, which is definitely on my mind right now because I am two days away from taking 35 of my own students to Yale Model Congress, which is a conference, a competition for Model Congress. Um, so my brain is kind of halfway there and then halfway on the fact, the reality that for the week that I'll be at Model Congress, I will also need to be recording an episode. So this is a little haphazard. I hope you don't mind, um, the sudden nature of my, uh, very apparent lack of ideas for content. Um, but I figured I just happened upon this today. The idea just kind of sparked up like literally a couple hours ago. And I figured, um, this actually might be kind of interesting to some of you. So, um, yeah, needless to say, it's been a bit of a busy week. Um, two days out from this big conference, I'm really stressed out. So if you can hear that, my voice, sorry. Um, I'm also under a time crunch to finish, uh, my applications for grad school, which are due in about less than a month. Um, and also like, by the way, I have a real job. So like, uh, there's just a lot been, that's been going going on. Um, but it's been kind of nice to just kind of sit down and uh, just talk for a little bit, uh, talk about things that, you know, I care about and hopefully you care about at least a little bit. Um, recently, in light of grad school applications, I've been asking for recommendations from my old professors from undergrad. Um, I'm about, I'm five years detached from uh, from college, which uh, I know some of you are current students. Um, some of you around my age have been out of college for a couple of years. And so if you've ever had to like ask for recommendations from professors who you haven't been in their classroom for like, you know, a good amount of time, um, it's always kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know if it's more uncomfortable for them or is it more uncomfortable for me. Um, but it's one of those things that if you're applying for a graduate program, they do ask for like academic recommenders. So I had a chance to talk to one of my old professors today. Um, really, really great conversation. Uh, Professor Pat Gears from Wolsey College, my major advisor, current department head um, at, in, in history, and just a really all-around awesome human being. And so um, as I was looking at that conversation, I was also looking back at some of the old papers I wrote when I was in college. I don't know if you, some of you who have uh, since graduated have done this. Um, whenever I look at my old undergrad work, I always like question to myself, I don't know if I got smarter or dumber in the year since I graduated. Because on the one hand, right, you know, five years experience of experience of, you know, life isn't for nothing. But on the other, you're like, I haven't actually written anything in the past five years and then you look at your work and you're like what evolved human being was I that I was able to produce this kind of work um but on the other hand you're looking at your stuff and you're just like man um as a 20 year old I can't believe that I actually like took myself this seriously so I looked back at one of my old papers from college uh, a couple hours ago um this was a course that I took exactly six years ago so this was written at the end of the fall semester of 2013. I was 20 years old. This was for a course uh, that was taught by Professor Giersch, um, and it was literally just called China and America. And um, it's still taught at Wellesley today. I think it's taught every other year. Um, so if you're a Wellesley student and you're listening to this, uh, take a look at that. It's, it was a good course. Um, the uh, Just looking up the, uh, the course description, it's described as... Um, a survey of China's economic, cultural, and political interactions with the United States from 1784 to present, with a focus on development since 1940. Principal themes include post-imperial China's pursuit of wealth and power, changing international conditions, military strategy, the influence of domestic politics and ideology, and the basic misunderstandings and prejudices that have long played this critical, critical relationship. Um, I don't know, that sounds pretty intriguing to me even now, but I remember that class as being just really interesting. Um, China and the U.S. have had not a particularly long relationship given the relative youth of America's, you know, existence as a country in comparison to China. Um, but the years in which the two countries have interacted, you know, it speaks for itself. It's an interesting relationship even now. And so to have an entire course, to be able to take an, an, an entire course on it was, you know, a real privilege. But then again, it was also kind of my major. So, um, I was looking at my final paper for that course uh, that was, again, I took that six years ago. 
Um, and the final paper I wrote about it was uh, on high school history courses. Um, it was really taking a, a dive into the AP U.S. history curriculum, as well as state standards for history courses um, in the United States. And it was initially aimed to discuss how uh, American social studies courses cover China, right? Like uh, under this underlying assumption that uh, American social studies classes even cover China to begin with, which I quickly found out was not the case, um, which I kind of should have known because I don't remember taking a China course in uh, my high school classes in the U.S. either. Um, so th I ended up pivoting uh, the topic towards um, looking at how China was portrayed in U.S. history courses, because instead of finding, um, you know, a lot of examples of China or East Asia focused social studies courses, I just found that a lot of um, the social studies curriculum in American high schools is focused on U.S. history. Um, and so it just felt more prudent to just look at that from, look at how China was portrayed through these U.S. history courses. Um, if you remember the last episode, the, the episode with the Model Congress people, um, we mentioned at one point of this like seeming overabundance from our shared high school memory. Um, we all went to high school in uh, Southern Connecticut. Um, the seeming overabundance of U.S. history slash like civics um, material in high school. Uh, this is something that like lots of people that we griped about on that episode that there was just like, you know, there's only so many times you could repeat the same like 300, 400 years of history before it gets stale. Um, but we would kind of study U.S. history like three, at least on three different occasions between like fifth, sixth grade to 12th grade. Um, and, and, and in that a very, very apparent lack of anything that was not Western history. This is something that, again, uh, my friends and I on that previous episode griped a lot about. This is something that my current students gripe about, that they like that they don't get to really see anything history-wise apart from like U.S. history or Western history. Um, and this was something that, in fact, when I was a high school student, I griped about a lot um, in a really, really obnoxious and semi-substantial way. Because the, the basically the reason why I decided to become an East Asian studies major in college, I had decided this very early on, like when I was, um, even before I matriculated into college, um, and it was mostly out of spite. It was mostly like, man, I learned zero anything about my culture, my history, my, like, you know, as if this was all about me um, when I was in, in high school and the world owes me something. So I'm going to spend like $200,000 of my parents' hard-earned money to study Chinese history. Obviously, my parents are thrilled. Um, but I think I was probably like the poster child of the, you know, obnoxious, um, overly self-confident 17-year-old who was like, the American education system is inadequate for me, and I'm going to go and study Chinese history a whole lot. But anyway, all, that's, all that is to say is that there is this like very, you know, many mul multiple circumstances, and I'm sure, again, if you went to school in the U.S., you probably could also attest to this. Um, there is a almost overexposure of U.S. history being taught in social studies classroom and an underexposure of like literally any other culture. I think like you might have taken like one or two maybe years of world history, very, very broad world history, um, maybe middle school, um, maybe 12th grade, depending on which state you're in. Um, but other than that, it was really rare to find like a required course that wasn't U.S. history. I think that was kind of the crux of it, that like if there was a required course for social studies, chances are it was like a U.S. history course or it was a civics course. Um, there is a reason for that, and I'll get to that later on, um, reasons why I shouldn't have been as bitter about that as I should as I was when I was 17. Um, but anyway, the paper that I was writing about was about exactly that. It was um, how, you know, it seemed like the American people throughout the ages have had this picture of what China was was like, how to perceive Chinese people, the Chinese government, Chinese culture, blah, blah, blah. Um, where did this national idea come from? I use the term national idea a lot in this paper. I didn't. I don't think that the term national idea is actually a, a term used in academia. Um, I think what I really wanted to say with that was kind of like um, the idea that if you're living in a country, right, there seem to be these shared values that aren't necessarily like moral values, but they're just kind of like a certain perception, certain stereotypes, if you want to really put it very bluntly and almost inaccurately. Um, that a certain populace would have towards, you know, either a certain value um, or certain people group or whatever, right? You know, how do we as Americans, how do Americans, you know, as a whole in a very, very like, you know, blankety sense, how do they view Chinese people, right? You really can't define that into one thing, but if you really, really, really wanted to simplify it almost like, you know, almost ahistorically, almost, you know, overly gratuitously, you could probably come up with something. And that was kind of what I was kind of picking at at this paper. 
Um, and, you know, I'll talk about this as we get, you know, deeper into the topic. But uh, what I found was that like in other countries, right, you would have propaganda to do that, right? Propaganda is a really easy way to kind of like instill certain ideas about certain people in a certain people group in order to in order to achieve a certain means. Um, America is not all about that life. And so we needed to find other maybe more subtle ways to kind of achieve the same ideals and if you look at it education um particularly the the secondary school classroom particularly history classes is a good place to do that um this was probably one of the more memorable papers that i wrote because the element this paper just seemed to have some really weird foreshadowing um it being about primarily about education um particularly about the high school classroom and when i wrote that paper i really was not thinking of being a teacher at all so like this weird sort of like you know kind of shows that i don't know destiny kind of leads you where you're supposed to be sometimes um so as i was rereading it i was thinking to myself again you know trying to give myself a little bit of grace because this was six years ago um but also maybe not so much grace because at that point i was like very much embedded in academia um and as as embedded as you can be as an undergrad um and i think as a whole when i was done reading it i was like thinking that this was like a decent ish paper um quality of the writing was pretty all right but i think like the depth of knowledge depth of depth of analysis was kind of like eh. um i didn't really impress myself when reading it again which i think for me more so more than to like just gripe and and you know be angsty about the quality of my work when i was you know 20 years old um it was just a reminder to Put, for me to put things in perspective when I'm reviewing my students' work, because I think when it comes to things like this, I, I do tend to be a little bit overly harsh on their level of analysis. Um, and so to remind myself that even as a college student, my level depth of analysis was nothing, you know, super impressive either. Um, because I remember at that time uh, when I was writing this paper, this was like, this was like, I think the only time when I actually when I was doing research, I actually had to physically go to the library to check out books to do research, right? And you can like go on JSTOR and just find articles and be like, rah, 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 there you go. Um, you had to literally go to the library, like search up on our on our school catalog what textbooks there were available because I was looking for school textbooks, um, you know, Howard Zinn's uh, People's History, whatever, like that sort of thing. Um, and I had to physically walk over to the library in the dead of the New England cold and snow um, to check out these books from Clap Library. Uh, and I, I know that there's someone who like was born before, you know, 1990, who's looking at this and being like, oh, you poor, sweet summer child, you know nothing. Um, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I would agree. But I, I remember doing that and being like, man, I was so hardcore. I was such a good student. And I'm just like, no, you just did the bare minimum. Um, but it was a memorable paper. And I think that's why I keep going back to it. Um, but anyway, I think the reason why I, I mean, you know, with a course on China, America, whatever, you could really... You could really write a paper on anything and it'd probably be interesting, but I think I picked on the education angle for the same reason why a lot of people kind of pick on education to, as something to kind of critique and to analyze or whatever, because it's kind of, I don't know, if you want to put it like unflatteringly, it's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, I have mentioned in previous episodes that it seems like, you know, almost everyone has an opinion on teaching, on education, on whatever, if only because almost everyone's been in school before. And so given that level of quote unquote expertise, you kind of feel like you're entitled to an opinion. And I think I was coming from that same like very arrogant space when I was a student. And so that's kind of why I picked on that. Um, but I think at the same time, we kind of, um, you know, I think people who have at least a shred of humility kind of know that, um, that they're coming in, you know, aware but not aware when they're coming in to critique education, but you still feel like you are entitled to your critiquing opinion because, again, like I mentioned in previous episodes, uh, the classroom teaching education is so high stakes that you feel like uh, there is always a reason to critique and every reason to critique is justified. Um and so kind of that's where I was in my, you know, senior year of college, um, my, my mind space, which is just very funny to think about given what I'm doing in life right now. Um, but anyway, I'm looking at that and I'm also looking at like um, how people thought about China at that time. So this was 2013. Um, and if you read the paper, right, um, it's really funny because there seemed to be like as I was writing it, um, it seemed to ride on this assumption that everyone believed that uh, China's main identity within the American uh, imagination was that it was this looming threat, like mostly this economic looming threat. Um, was it really a threat? No. A lot of it is just built up like, you know, just people being panicky about, you know, one country being better than U.S. 
Um, but but during that time, I, I remember in 2013, that was kind of like people's opinions on China didn't really expand past the point or really didn't reach a, a point of sophistication that was past really like um, China's going to take over the world someday because they have a lot of money. Um, it really, yeah, lay perceptions were not much more sophisticated than that. Obviously, things have changed um even again as a lay person your perception i feel like people's perceptions of china have changed a lot it's not as much seen as like a th- i don't know i feel like this really depends on who your community is and who you ask but 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 yeah it was just interesting to think about that and i feel like a lot of my paper kind of hinged on that assumption so it's it's interesting to read it now knowing that that is no longer the like um the common assumption amongst people um uh, 2013 was an interesting time to be studying china this was also I think a couple of just a couple of months after I wrote before I wrote the paper that was when Xi Jinping just came into power and I remember being in like Chinese politics courses just as that was happening and I don't think I really understood the profundity of it until now um but anyway you know six years down the line you see how much China has changed Anyway, uh, like I said before, the paper that I was writing really sought to discuss the basis of the these quote unquote national ideas of China within the American in the minds of Americans. Again, I don't really think I ever defined what national ideas really meant. Um, but again, like I mentioned before, it's just kind of like these very very generalized layperson perceptions of certain ideals and morals and you know uh, like people's images of uh, different uh, different people, um, different countries. Countries. And so again, uh, the paper really discusses that and makes the case that like in the absence of state propaganda, which we don't really have in really explicit existence, um, that that America as a country, perhaps as a government, um, you know, as a culture, a society, whatever unifying top, you know, top level body there is, um, these national ideas are transmitted through the public school classroom, which again, simple overly simplified idea um but i think to a degree um six years later i still think this is to a degree true um to put it kind of nicely the public school like social studies slash history classroom is a vehicle to democratize knowledge um because it's accessible to anyone right it, it's there to ensure access to the same kind of necessary information needed to uphold the integrity of a voting populace which i think if you were to d- describe like america being as large as it is um what power does each person have well, responsibility does each person have while well, they got to vote um and that's kind of the impetus for you know that's that's the the stakes of educating educating an entire population of people right and so the the history the public school history slash social social studies classroom is kind of like a vehicle a tool for that um you know that that they will that everyone will have the same access to the same information no matter their a student's background uh what family they come from their income level whatever uh That's putting it nicely. But if you were to put it more bluntly, you could say that, like, if you have an idea about your country or, like, other countries that you want to disseminate to an entire populace in order to influence how they think or behave, um, but you don't want to resort to propaganda, then just teach it in the classroom to impressionable young people. And if you want to do a really good job and don't want to seem that, like, forward about it, you can mask it as objective historical fact. And I think that was kind of where I was getting at with this paper, this idea that like in the US, we're not big believers of propaganda, but we still need a way to disseminate these national ideas. And the way we do it is through history classes. Um, Again, not a particularly groundbreaking concept. Um, Probably, you know, there's much more nuance to this than my 20 year old self was really getting at. But at the end of the day, you know, like, this is just the final paper for an undergrad history course. Um, you know, don't make it a bigger deal than it actually is. And so um, it's interesting, again, reading it now, not just given the current political climate um, of 2019, but also reading it in the context that I'm currently in professionally um, as a high school teacher that teaches Chinese language, not necessarily social studies. I think this would be super interesting if I was actually a social studies teacher, but I'm not. Um, I teach Chinese instead, uh, which, you know, again, my main focus as a language teacher is to teach language. Um, I have a complicated relationship with teaching culture that I think I'll save for another episode when we'll talk about that. But um, 
what what weighs on my mind a lot of the time now is the reality that most of my students, uh, present and future probably, will probably learn the most about China from my classes than they will in any other history course. Uh, given like you know state requirements for how often we teach, how many iterations of American history we teach that is required for the social studies classroom, I think.、Um, If there's a student that enters my classroom, that's where my classroom is where they're going to learn the most about China, and so、um, that makes this topic particularly interesting to me.、Um, but yeah, again, that as well as the you know geopolitical, sociopolitical、uh, changes between you know both internally in China as well as how U.S.-China relations and mutual perceptions of you know people on a people-to-people -people basis have changed the past six years.、Um, again, like you know, it goes back to. I, I'm just so struck by when I was reading that paper. It almost seemed as if like everyone on the planet there, there was just underlying assumption that people's perception of China was that it was this looming economic threat,、um, to the point where like it seemed deceptively easy to argue that the idea of China becoming this threat、uh, was a timeless value rather than one that was just very limited to like the early 2000s and 2010s.、Um, Yeah, I remember being in class and people connecting、uh, American fears of China, China's economic prowess, to like you know the Yellow Peril, the Chinese Exclusion Act, this idea of China as a threat. Which I think again you could probably draw some loose lines to, but it's not as if this was the prevailing, timeless, you know, overarching、uh, thing that defined how American people saw China. I think that's kind of important to to kind of think about the idea that、um, that these values. Change、um, circumstantially,、um, and and people are not static beings. People, especially people groups, are not static beings. I think that was one thing that that I got out of、uh, Professor Gears's class、uh, over and over again. And so it's interesting that that assumption came up in a in the paper I wrote for his class, and then now is being somewhat、um, walking back on that now. So anyway.、Um, We're gonna spend today. This is how hurting I am for content, but I figured this might be interesting to at least some of you nerds out there.、Um, we're gonna spend today kind of picking apart this paper. The paper, I'm gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna yell at me. It's it's 14 pages long.、Um, I'm not gonna go through every single bit of it because even when I was reading, I think I got a little bored.、Um, but but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read some excerpts from it,、um, from from beginning to end, and just kind of I don't know in internet terms react to it a little bit, given the again context of things. I haven't planned this out a lot because I've realized that the more I plan out, the worse I do, and so we'll just we'll just see how this goes.、Um, I'm not going to post the full text of the paper anywhere because I know better than to embarrass myself that way.、Um, disclaimer: Not a social studies teacher. I've never been a social studies teacher, so there might be a couple things I say about social studies teaching or history teaching pedagogy that feel really obnoxious or misinformed or. Obnoxiously misinformed. So, if you're a history teacher out there, and I say something that's like really egregious, feel free to call me out on that. At me on Twitter, whatever. Okay.、Um, so, let's get started. Ah,、uh, gotta dig this up. Okay. All right. The paper starts. Oh gosh.、Uh, the generation of preservation of national ideas. There it is. That is the virtues and values upheld by an entire country, its government, and its population is part and parcel to the generation preservation of a national identity. There are numerous ways to preserve national identity through the comprehensive dispersion of national ideas amongst a nation's citizenry, citizenry, all with varying levels of clarity and obviousness of its nationalistic intentions. North Korea, for instance, holds a mass games every year to commemorate and praise the North Koreans. North Korean heads of state, as well as the Workers Party of Korea, to the average American, such a blatant show of government instrumented nationalism. Instrumented. I don't think that's a word. Might seem comically artificial and coercive. Ironically, the nature of this reaction finds its roots in the values and virtues embedded within the American national identity, one that is oftentimes defined by its emphasis on civil liberties in the domestic sphere and altruistic interventionism in the international arena. Hmm. However, the, the United States has never employed a mass games or any other state-mandated nationalist exercise of their own in order to spread and maintain these national ideas. Nevertheless, certain national ideas have managed to sustain themselves through the generations and are powerful enough to have shaped American foreign and domestic policy for decades. How then are national ideas transmitted through the generations, and how have they been able to maintain their integrity to such a high degree? Willful acceptance of nationalist ideals within a culture that places a high value on self-determinism can only occur if these nationalist ideals are. Presented through unbi unbiased, undisputed historical fact. In that sense, American history textbooks become the tools with which Americans are taught, albeit somewhat typo, somewhat clandestinely, to uphold nationalist ideals. Interesting. Just looking back on, like, it seems like a very big leap to just go straight from like、um, 
we don't have propaganda, so what do we, how do we indoctrinate our people to, like, history textbooks, obviously. Um, if I were rewriting this, I'd probably bridge that a little more, but then again, I also tend to be a little overly verbose, so maybe it was, we're better off that way. Um, moving on. What is interesting about American history textbook revisionism, <laughs> it's really funny, I have, my, I have my professor's comments on here, and he, like, highlighted the word revisionism, and then he said, like, is this the correct word choice? And I'm like, no, it's not. Um, what is interesting about American history textbook alternate word for revisionism because it's not that however is the fact that revisionism cannot presented cannot be presented in a way that blatantly praises the united states or disparages other countries um yeah interesting because i think if you look at other countries like social studies curriculums i mean this is probably not as much the case anymore but i think i'm just referencing this my, my direct interaction with this was um when i was studying in taiwan uh this was a language textbook but it was published in like the 1950s which the 1950s taiwan was like under martial law and you could be disappeared for saying something bad about the the kmt um but even in a language textbook uh, that was published in that time um it was very blatantly obvious that there was a very nationalist patriotic spin to everything and I think to a certain degree that is present in other countries textbooks I think this will be a recurring theme that other countries tend to do this and it's a given it's a norm in uh in social studies classes to like you know it's very clear that the aim of social studies classes history classes is to really you know make your country out to be the hero and everyone else to be kind of like um you know on your side or an enemy or a loser um and other countries do this all the time uh and as the u.s we look at that and we kind of like cringe at it because it it kind of goes against our our you know western i don't know american sensibilities um and yet you know there is a certain benefit to to teaching history in that way as revisionist um and whitewashed as it is and so i would imagine that like if you're I don't know, a person in power, and you, you, you would benefit from having a citizenry who thinks that your country is the best thing ever. Um, so how do you do that without making people mad, right? Um, anyway, I just re-summarized everything that I just wrote, but let's go on. What is interesting about American history textbook revisionism, however, again, word choice, is the fact that revisionism cannot be presented in a way that blatantly praises the United States or disparages other countries. This creates an intriguing contradiction in which American values on individual liberty and free thinking can only be upheld by the subtle violation of those liberties. Ooh. When examining the troubled history surrounding Sino-American relations, do people actually say Sino-American anymore? Is that like not okay to say? Um, academics, let me know. Uh, for instance, it is rare to see an American history textbook make belittling or malignant remarks against China, right? Um, this actually, I think I actually end up going back on this because this is more like a modern textbook thing. Old textbooks um, from the U.S. who talk about American history definitely talk about China in a belittling, belittling or malignant way. Um, continuing on. Despite this, the United States has had a long-standing legacy of painting China as a perpetual other, a national idea that has developed and sustained itself within the American psyche for decades, despite the fact that modern American history textbooks rarely portray China in a blatantly negative light. Interesting. Considering that the American history classroom is perhaps one of the most important and most timeless arenas in which nationalist ideas are transmitted to the general populace, and considering the lasting and relatively unchanging national idea portraying China as the perpetual other, how is the otherization of China sustained and perpetuated through American history education? Uh, one look at curriculum standards for social studies throughout the United States immediately presents an interesting dilemma. There is very little coverage of non-Western cultures and histories at any grade level, and any existing study of Chinese history and culture is superficial and scant. Mm. Educational standards in Massachusetts and Connecticut required world history, that is, history of countries and cultures outside of the United States education, during middle school for one to two years. However, the standards applied to middle school world history curriculum tend to be over overly simplistic and ideally sophisticated at the same time. Sorry, idealistically sophisticated at the same time. Um, this is funny. Massachusetts social studies curricular standards require that sixth graders be able to explain the political and economic status of Taiwan, while also suggesting the Great Wall of China as an appropriate vantage point from which to study China due to its high level of recognition. Um, yeah, I remember, so first of all, um, it was really fun to, I, I picked Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, because Massachusetts is where Wellesley was in, and Connecticut was where I grew up, so, like, I took, I went to high school in Connecticut, I went to college in Massachusetts, it just made sense, but also, Massachusetts 
Massachusetts tends to be pretty um, pretty respected for the level of rigor that their curriculum standards go under. But I remember reading this when I was doing my research six years ago and looking at the list and it just really looked like someone who, I don't know, I mean, this is fair because you can't assume that, you know, there's a lot more countries out there outside of China to study history for and social studies for, but it really seemed like someone who took like a, a general survey course on here are countries in Asia and here are their issues, kind of, sort of, and then put them into a list. Otherwise, you really wouldn't, you really shouldn't like expect that six, you should, you really shouldn't establish, um, you know, political and economic status of Taiwan as a curricular standard alongside saying, the Great Wall of China is a great place to start with teaching China because everyone knows what it is. Those are like, that's like quantum physics versus like simple machines. So um, yeah, I, I remember just like looking at that and kind of laughing. So um, continuing on. Similar standards are applied towards Massachusetts high school world history education, while Connecticut social studies standards do not require any high school world history coursework. I don't know if this is actually true. I guess I have footnotes for this, but no, we really, we really didn't. We had like Western Civ for like freshman year, and then beyond that, 10th grade was civics, um, 11th grade was U.S. history, and 12th grade, I guess, was like Oh, no, you you were done with social studies. It was three years of social studies and you were done. You could graduate. And I think the closest thing to non-Western civilization, social studies course, I don't even think there was one. I think sixth grade was like, sixth grade was the last time an entire year was spent on not U.S. history. And that was like Greek ancient civ. Um, there was never really, a, I'm sure this has changed. This is very variable between states between schools whatever but i'm thinking about it now and having done all of my you know primary secondary schooling in connecticut there was never a point where we even touched on east asian history which again you can see why i was like stupidly bitter at age 17 but it was also the reason why i walked into my first uh general east asian history survey course again taught by professor Giersch. um and i remember thinking like i was all that because like eh, i'm east asian that's my thing i was a really really intelligent teenager obviously um and walking out of that course being like i know nothing everyone knows all the things and i'm like i barely can like I barely can name like three dynasties. Um, this is not good news, guys. I mean, you don't have to be an East Asian studies major to, to feel that dumb over something. Um, but this is basic, like what you would think is specialized knowledge within a secondary school curriculum that focuses almost exclusively on Western civilization or U.S. history. Um, I don't know, man. If I, as an East Asian studies major, was coming into my first history course not being able to name more than three, the names of three dynasties, it's really, really sad, guys. Okay, so, like, this is pretty depressing so far. Um, let's continue on to AP. Um, this disparity becomes increasingly apparent in the curriculum and examination breakdown for United States history and world history advanced placement courses, which are utilizing classrooms across the United States. Um, I think I went towards uh, zooming in on the AP because I think it's the closest thing that we have to a quote unquote national uh, national curricular standard for United States history. Again, if you're coming from outside the U.S., um, most countries have a nationalized curriculum. Again, the U.S. does not. We have state standards. So it's kind of hard to nail down what everyone in a America learns because it's all kind of slightly different. Um, but the AP is kind of one thing you could look at because it's not, most students don't take AP courses, um, but it's like one curriculum that is standardized across many, many states. And it's also just a general U.S. history survey course. It's equivalent of like a first year college course. Um, and so it's just like, you know, I, I think you could have, you could make an argument for a more granular sort of, you know, analysis, something better to look at. But I think given, again, if I was like 20 and kind of dumb, um, this was a good place to start. So, uh, similar to state-backed social studies curricular standards in Massachusetts and Connecticut, American history is taught as its own course. Everything else, with the conspicuous exception of European history, which is also taught as its own course, I don't know why I pointed that out, um, is consolidated into one world history course and advanced placement test. So, oh, to clarify, so again, in terms of history, maybe things have changed, but so correct me if I'm wrong, but there's like three main AP history courses. There's AP US history, there's AP European history, and then there's AP world history, which um, not a lot of schools offer. Um, and if you look at the scope of it, it's kind of easy to see why, because they literally go from like prehistory to present day um, and cover the history of everything. <laughs> like everything that's not covered in great detail in AP Euro or AP US history 
gets kind of stuffed into world history. So that's where you'll find your like Asian history. That's where you'll find your like your your African history, your Latin American history, whatever, all packed into one one single year course. Um, maybe there's some like social studies magic that I am just not privy to, but I have a hard time kind of rationalizing that. But you know, again, social studies teachers, correct me, please. Uh, let's continue. Uh, the AP World History curriculum, yeah, I talked about this. Um, not a lot of people take the AP World History exam. It's like about 190,000 students take the AP World History exam. Um, and in contrast, about 400,000 students took the AP US History exam. So obviously, AP US is a lot more popular than World History, which means that not uh, m- far more kids are taking classes and uh, serious classes in United States history as opposed to everyone else's history. Let's continue. In light of this evidence, it does not seem prudent to draw direct parallels between the otherization of China and American society and the portrayal of China in American history textbooks as there is not enough coverage of Chinese history and politics in history courses taught in American classrooms for it alone to significantly impact the American perception of China. Um, Yeah, stating the obvious here, right? If you don't talk about a certain, like, country in classrooms, you cannot blame the classroom for affecting people's views on it. Most students' exposure to world history education takes place in the context of learning about United States history, and any knowledge about China gained in the classroom is first presented in the context of the American history narrative. I feel like this is very, like, you know, point A to point B to point C logic that is probably faulty in some places, Um, but I think my reasoning behind this is kind of like, um, where do you learn about China? Well, you learn about in history class. What do you learn in history class? We learn about United States history. So the only place where you will learn about China is within the context of United States history, which then would be in the context of United States-China relations. Um, and so that's kind of, again, what I, what I kind of pin my thesis on for this, uh, for this paper. Again, you know, if you're a PhD student, PhD student or a professor, whatever, in history, like you can kind of see this is very somewhat sophomoric th- thinking. But again, final paper, undergrad class, we'll go with it. Uh, Therefore, in order to fully understand the portrayal of China in American history textbooks, one must first understand the portrayal of America in American history textbooks. I probably thought it was super clever by writing that. Incidentally, the portrayal of America in American history textbooks is not presented without bias. Francis Fitzgerald's 1979 book, America Revised, was an er early look at the active usage and manipulation of history textbooks by district governments, special interest groups, business groups, and various social pressures in order to promote patriotism, morality, civil literacy, and a sense of unilateral American citizenship in students across the United States. In particular, Fitzgerald identifies a one nation, one people emphasis as the, as the common ideological thread connecting most American history textbooks, in which cases of consensus and, and unity amongst the American people throughout history are emphasized over cases of conflict and other counter narratives. In emphasizing the presence of a unilateral and, in some ways, monolithic American citizenry, a clear dichotomy between, between us Americans and everyone else, that being other nations, immigrants, etc., is drawn, highlighted, and presented to students as undoctored historical reality. I feel like maybe I was being a little dramatic about this but as i was reading this all i could think about were like the covers of uh u.s history textbooks that i used you know throughout middle school and high school um the the kind of uh you know decorative verbiage that's used to kind of uh, brand the textbooks in a sense i don't know i I have a hard time kind of articulating this on the spot but i think there in my gut uh you know 12 years of public schooling kind of speaking to this i think i think this is true i think there was definitely sort of like a um focus on unity i don't know if this was purely an aesthetic choice um just something to pin um american history on i think at the same time, you could make historical arguments for this as well. The idea that um, the prevailing narrative of uh, the American history story um, is talking about who gets included, who who is considered a citizen, who is considered an American, um, and how these different people groups kind of get uh, braided into the mix slowly and who gets excluded. I think something that has academic in- integrity to it, I think that's the best way you could frame it. But I think if you put it over simplistically, um, which, and I'll talk about this in a bit, that high school classrooms tend to be just out of necessity, um, you could very easily just look at that and be like, America is one and it is one thing only like it is a monolith um it is the melting pot so to speak and and there is a sense of uniformity in the american identity that um that lacks the nuance that is necessitated with the the population that is inherently as diverse as america is given its history um and and so the danger this is not like the idea of presenting america as this this like what fitzgerald said is a one nation one people emphasis i don't think this is inherently a bad thing um, but it really becomes harmful given 
the practical constraints of how you teach this idea. Um, and, and the power in this statement is all about the nuance. And the thing is, is with teenagers in the high school classroom, nuance is something that is very easily lost. So we'll get to that later on. Uh, let's continue. With regards to foreign relations, Fitzgerald also observes the consistent depiction of the United States as a, I love this, as a young Siegfried, magically strong and innocent of the burdens of history, yet at the same time an orphan, surrounded by potential enemies in an unrecognizable world. I love this, like, this, uh, this humanization of, uh, of states. Let's continue. In many ways, the United States carries an image of stoic, naive, but nonetheless powerful neutrality in an otherwise chaotic world, which therefore lends way to the propagation of the American moral burden within the textbook narrative. American motives in foreign affairs are almost always depicted as being altruistic. Efforts are made to instill pride in the American institutions and propel an urgency to spread these institutions as rapidly and widely as possible. I have a footnote here, but I'm just like... Man, that sounds super bold, but let's go with it. While other states are clearly portrayed as being hawkish or dovish in any given global conflict, the United States is simply depicted as being evasive. I think this was probably truer in like pre World War pre World War era America, um, but even within you know twentieth century conflict, you could probably see bits and pieces of this. It's interesting that um, in an effort to keep history from being just like a straight up, you know, a memorization of dates and facts. We try to make American history into a story and we turn countries into characters. And again, if you're looking at this from like, these are teenagers and we just want them to be able to observe the material in a meaningful and somewhat engaging way. This is, you know, again, the, uh, I guess the young reader's edition of a very, very complicated novel. And so if we portray the United States as being like uh, this, this well-meaning, you know, all shucks sort of like good guy, and then everyone else are these extremists, um, you know, it's it's not, if given, if this were a movie, it's not hard to see who the hero is, right? Um, again, whose fault is this? Is this? Is this academically or intellectually honest? No, probably not. But again, if the aim is to get students to interact and engage with history in some way, this is a better alternative than just le like giving them like a bunch of dates. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think this will become a recurring theme in like, you know, a lot of the issues that we see with, you know, bias or inherent, I don't know, like revisionist stuff that happens um, rather intentionally or otherwise in in the teaching of history to high school students, it really just boils down to like, what are we capable of disseminating to, to teenagers at this time? Do we have the, are we capable? Are we able to really communicate the nuances? Um, I think that's something that, that I'm not sure we'll be able to answer by the end of this episode, but it's something to consistently ponder. So let's continue. Okay, Fitzgerald's 1979 theories are echoed in James Lowen's 1996 book with the second edition published in 2007, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. Yeah, super clickbaity or the equivalent of clickbaity title in 1996. Um, the book, if you, I remember the cover, it looked a little bit like conspiracy theory-esque, but it was a pretty decent book, um, especially since it was, it was really, you know, it directly references this Fitzgerald book, um, which is a little less, you know, clickbaity. Uh, Lowen picks up where Fitzgerald leaves off in 1979, noting the continuing young Siegfried depiction of the United States and highlighting a line often quipped by American history books, uh, American history textbooks. Um, quote, despite setbacks, the United States overcame these challenges. Uh, he identifies the Eurocentric, Eurocentric bent in American history textbooks as psychotherapy for whites, a phenomenon that not only causes disinterest among students who do not fit the model of white male affluence, but also encourages apathy for non-American histories and cultures across all student demographics. Wow, that's a lot packed into one sentence um yeah i think again this kind of like echoes back to which no surprise because again this book references fitzgerald's 1979 book um about how we how the united states is portrayed as neither the super macho superhero nor this very soft you know dovish sort of figure it's kind of like um it's like the uh, the underdog Americans love a good underdog story, and I think maybe this kind of plays into that. Um, psychotherapy for whites. Yeah, interesting terminology. I think because, again, if you have a, a neutral, all shucks sort of, if you personify uh, the America like that, um, it's 
therefore by relation really easy to look at what America did or didn't do and see them as neither the uh, the do-gooders or the do-badders. Um, it's kind of like things happened to us given these circumstances and it wasn't our fault. Um, this tied into this terminology psychotherapy for whites. Given the amount of history and arguable damage that was done by white people, um, both in the domestic and the international sphere by the United States, um, that absolvement of guilt um, and responsibility, if we write that into the narrative, um, it fits in pretty well with the kind of character play that we're doing with uh, with with the United States here. So um, probably a lot more to unpack than that, but I'll just leave that at that for now. Um, a quote from one of Lowen's former high school students proves particularly telling, quote, if Africa had a history worth learning about, we would have learned about it last year in Western civilization class. So again, what this is pointing towards is like um, the way in which what we expose to students in the classroom and what we don't expose them to has a very, very direct correlation to what they care about and what, or rather what they see as being worth caring about, right? That's a very like, it almost seems like almost fake how, how what that sounds like. But to be honest, I, I would believe that, that a student would say that. If I've read history worth learning about, we would have learned about it last year in Western civilization. If it's not graded, why would I learn it? There you go. Lowen claims that American history textbooks simplify American history into a one-dimensional depiction of the past featuring a simple-minded morality play, which is what I was talking about earlier, with only one real message to its student readers, to become a good citizen. Indeed, Chinese history is only mentioned in American history textbooks if it fits within the pre-existing American citizenship building narrative. The depiction of China in American history textbooks has undergone some evolution, but it alone does not serve as sufficient evidence to track the American perception of China from generation to generation, as there has always been very minimal coverage of Sino-American affairs in, in American history textbooks. So again, this is a, this is where I got kind of stuck in terms of like there is no material for me to research. So, uh, the textbook *An American History* was written by David Seville Mun Seville. French, Muzzy in 1911, whose writing on Sino-American relations takes on a tone befitting that of the anti-Chinese social fervor at the time. So 1911, guys. Still 20th century, but I think, again, reoccurring theme. Um, education evolves constantly, and there's no better example. Just, just ask what your parents learned in school uh, when they were students and compare that to what you learned in school when you were a student and then ask like a current student what they're learning and you'll see like just from methodology alone there is so much that has changed um something to think about so 1911 doesn't seem that long ago but it was a long time ago in terms of education years um blah, blah, blah. chinese immigrant railroad workers are described as a menace who are content with dirty quarters and poor food this is a textbook this is not like an editorial this is like classroom textbook while the spirit boxers um religious sect group in china um in the 19th century are portrayed as violent and conspiring though the boxer rebellion itself is only given passing reference and used to serve as striking proof of the united states new position in the affairs of the world world. Um, wow. Additionally, the Chinese Exclusion Act is described as an arrangement made with China in which China agreed to the regulation of labor immigration on American terms. Uh, nevertheless, the span of the 700-page textbook only mentions China a handful of times, and the events highlighted within the timeline of Sino-American relations either contribute an integral part of the telling of the greater American historical narrative, e.g. the impact of Chinese immigrant labor, or emphasize America's growing global influence during the early 20th century, e.g. the Boxer Rebellion. Though an American history only covers American history until 1900, duh, because it was published in 1911, it was the most widely used American history textbook in the United States until the 1950s. Yeah, so there are still people alive who, like, learn history under this, uh, under this purview, which is kind of, you know, I mean, not, not, not unexpected, but kind of, kind of terrifying. Um, not because of, like, the blatantly racist stuff in here, but because it's, like, really ahistorical, um, and and not actually even accurate particularly the bits about like uh, the spirit boxers and all that uh the successors of an american history so this is kind of like our base point like it does not get earlier than 1911 how does it evolve since it? the successors of an american history are much less coarsely worded but still echo the nationalistic and moralistic platforms adopted by earlier text albeit in a far more muted fashion. The American Pageant by Thomas A. Bailey was first published in 1956. Currently, the textbook is one of several texts suggested by the College Board for AP United States History Classes. I'm laughing as I say this because this was the reason why I chose this, was because this was the textbook I used um, when I took Ameri AP, AP American U.S. History in high school. Anyone, particularly uh, all everyone who was on the previous episode for Model Congress, 
use this textbook. I don't even know if they still use this textbook now. Uh, new, edition, new editions of the text are released periodically with the latest edition covering the first term of the Obama administration. This again, this was written in 2013, so uh, yep, makes sense. However, coverage of Sino-American relations remains scant and subtly biased. Oh, bold. The Boxer Rebellion is described as a movement led by a super patriotic group while the Chinese Exclusion Act is omitted altogether. Uh, it's really funny because my professor, again, reading his comments, he highlighted super patriotic group and wrote, yikes. <laughs> uh, agreed. Um, and I'm really surprised. I guess it was, a, yeah, I have footnotes for this. Uh, they didn't talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act at all. Wow. And this was, this was the latest edition. This wasn't even the edition that I used when I was a student. Um, yeah, so, so that should offer somewhat of an explanation as to my ignorance about everything Chinese related when I went into college. Um, that's very surprising. I don't think you could really get away with that now. Um, the Nixon trip to Beijing is summarized in two sentences. Uh, again, really big moment in, in American history as well. So to only mention two sentences in that is kind of offensive. Um, as is the Tiananmen incident, uh, which is not a U.S., directly a U.S. China relations thing, but very important on the global, like, affected everything. Um, where in particular emphasis, oh man, where in t about the Tiananmen incident, where in particular emphasis is placed on the Goddess of Liberty statue, which uh, the text was described as being modeled on the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of the Chinese people's aspirations. Wow. McCarthyism is downplayed even in the context of Soviet-American relations and the Cold War. To cut out McCarthyism from American history? I mean, not cut it out, but like, not really. Man, this textbook was like, is like a current textbook. Wow. The American pageant does present an interesting, albeit somewhat ahistorical counter argument to the well-known notion that the United States lost China to communism, positing that China was never the United States to lose because Chiang Kai-shek did not control all of China prior to the communist takeover. So... The idea behind this was kind of like the book, basically, there's this preconceived notion that like um, once China fell to the communists or fell, quote unquote, to the communists, um, this was a loss for the United States uh, because the, the, it was like the communists taking over China rather than the, uh, the, the nationalists, uh, which was a Republican government. Um, and they so this is like a, a counter argument to a popular argument saying that the uh, the loss of China was a loss of the United States because Chiang Kai-shek was the United States proxy in China. Yeah, um, you know, it's kind of like big brain logic here that doesn't really come through. Uh, okay, this is where it gets interesting. Um, even progressive texts lean towards similar tendencies of glossing over events in Sino-American relations. A People's History of the United States is a 1980 alternative text, often used for, used for comparative purposes in high school and university classrooms, uh, and is often accused of being anti-American and sympathetic to socialist causes. Much of the text focuses on instances of American imperialism in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Makes sense, because those were kind of the trendy causes at that time, um, as well as before 1980, with particular attention paid to the Vietnam War, and in the second edition published in 2003, uh, 2003, the Gulf War. However, much like other American history textbooks, a people's history barely features any coverage on China. This proves interesting as a depiction of brutally imperialist American interventionism in the so-called third world non-European countries is fairly consistent throughout the text to the extent that the United States is portrayed as an oppressor of any non-European state. Um, the footnote here where I said the notable exception to this is pre-World War II Japan, which the book scarcely mentions but largely considers to be an oppressor of different stripes but comparable power. After the American atomic bombing in 1949, Japan is only mentioned in the context of the aftermath of the Potsdam Declaration. Hmm, okay. More specifically, the United States is never portrayed as an equal with any other non-European country. This is talking about Zinn's portrayal of the United States. As non-European countries are regarded as being too inherently weak to stand up to American imperialism. On a superficial level, this theory largely holds true in most cases of American interventionism outside of Western Europe. However, the narrative freezes up once China enters the picture as China has never presented itself as anything less than an equal to the United States. Oh boy. China was repeatedly fetishized, exoticized, feared, or otherwise subjugated by the United States throughout history, but it was never truly in a position where the United States saw it as weak enough to be colonized or occupied to the extent as that of its neighboring East and Southeast Asian states. The United States did not blatantly exploit China in the same way that it exploited Korea or the Philippines. Nevertheless, a people's history portrays China in a similarly victimized light on the few occasions in which China is mentioned in the text. So this is kind of a narrative thing. Um, for instance, the book identifies the rise of communism in China as the closest thing in the long history of that ancient ancient country, wow, to a people's government independent of outside control. Hmm, okay. 
From the most conservative and borderline xenophobic history texts to textbooks outrightly accused of being anti-American, the depiction of Sino-American relations throughout history remains text remains one that paints China as weak and lacking self-determination. The general approach to foreign affairs in American history textbooks is one that regards Western European countries as rivals or allies of equal status in terms of political power, economic competitiveness, etc., while all other countries are to some degree inferior to American political or economic might. So again, narrative building... Um, whatever. As generalized as this approach may be, however, its presentation as unbiased fact in a history textbook makes for a highly skewed vantage point from which young American students begin to anal examine and analyze the United States foreign affairs. These flawed perceptions are doubly enforced by caricaturized media portrayals of Anglo-American wealth. Anglo-American wealth? Why? What? Okay. Progressiveness and power in, in contrast to third world poverty, weakness, and corruption everywhere else. With no viable form of pushback towards these heavily enforced historical stereotypes, the skewed picture of American foreign relations becomes a widely accepted reality amongst American youth. Yeah, so I think what I was saying here is that like even um, no matter what textbook you're working from, there is this very oversimplified portrayal of both what America is and both what China is. Um, and it, and it's still, regardless of the, where it falls in the political spectrum, um, it still will reinforce this idea either like America as an exceptionalized privileged group and that be, a, a privileged country and that is being a good thing or an exceptionalized oppressive power which is a bad thing either way um, it misses out on this idea that U.S. and China again were at some point comparable powers like that and that is very much the crux of the, I don't want to say the crux, but an important part of understanding uh, U.S.-China history, um, this this clashing of two great powers, so to speak. I'm very afraid that, like, my professor is listening to this and he's being like, have I taught you nothing? But hopefully none of this is that, that, it's been a while since I've been in the classroom, so um, I have a degree on this, I have a degree on this. <sighs> okay, uh, let's continue. Let's talk about, let's talk about kids. <laughs> for, but for many of these same youth, the global prominence of China is a jarring contradiction to this widely accepted reality. This cognitive dissonance of the students is less a result of unfavorable, unfavorable portrayals of China in American history textbooks, but instead a result of highly favorable portrayals of the United States and American moralism in American history textbooks. Ah, the realization of China's relative global power and wealth in conjunction with inadequate education on Chinese history and culture outside the parameters of the American moralism narrative leads to a sudden mental reassignment of China's status from backwards unmodernized, a modernized Asian state to a potential foreign rival. The presence of a new rival, and one that is so culturally dissimilar to that of existing European rivals at that, instinctively prompts one to identify all the ways in which China is different from the United States, most of which are simply negative stereotypes. Overpopulation, communist ideology, poor human rights record, high levels of pollution, limited civil liberties, exotic culture, etc. Um, regardless of textbook, if all that what American students have learned about China is that China is a weaker state, which is an ahistorical point of view because that's not actually true. Um, and then all of a sudden, so they learn that in the classroom, they, they recognize China as being backwards and weak and whatever and the loser in a lot of things that happened in history and then all of a sudden they walk into reality in like you know the mid 2000s or wherever they're at um, and they see China as this rising power uh, they have to reconcile these two contradicting what seems like facts um, and so like what happens then is that like you if you see like something that you did not or a country or people that you did not respect because you thought they were like backwards and dumb and, and whatever and all of a sudden they're gaining legitimacy um you know that turns them into rival status and it's like a scary rival because not only are they a rival they're unexpected and they're also what did i say culturally dissimilar to that of existing european rivals and if that becomes the most like keystone way to identify something, then what you're going to do is you're going to identify all the ways in which China is different. Um, and, and that oftentimes just reduces itself to negative stereotypes, which we mentioned before. Okay, uh, I'm hoping I'm reading my past self correctly. <laughs> um, the combination of inadequate education of the realities of Chinese history, politics, and culture with the, with the educational institutionalization of American moralistic patriot, patriot, patriotism creates a circumstance in which American students are unable to conceptualize what China is without identifying what China is not relative to their understanding of America and American identity. By conflating a heavily nationalistic perspective on American identity with their premature understanding of Chinese identity, American students adopt a perspective that otherwise otherizes China more strongly and more permanently than one derived simply from unfavorable textbook portrayals of China alone. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess this is kind of like because no one just straight up told them that America's awesome and China is not awesome. Um, 
they they are kind of led to feel like they have come to that same conclusion on their own um and that makes that uh, viewpoint feel a lot more potent because it's not something that someone um kind of fed them but it's something that kind of they were able to put the pieces together themselves but the problem is that those pieces were still given to to them by someone else uh i think i'm getting again i hope i'm reading past self care this is one of those moments where i'm just like i think i might have gotten dumber in six years i just need to go back to school again uh, secondary education is in is an interesting baseline with which to observe the per perception of a nation's foreign affairs. Not only does it represent the knowledge possessed by every member of a given citizenry, not every member, oh. um, but it is ev elevated for its impartiality and is often scrutinized for signs of bias and revisionism. Mm, depending on the place. The lasting legacy of regarding China as other throughout American history is one that could logically be connected to education, especially considering the significant role of social studies education in shaping national identity and global perception. But does education in itself directly uphold the otherization of China in the United States? To some degree, education creates a foundation for the otherization of China to sustain itself, and that there are very few viable forces in media or society that actively contra contradict the inherent biases found in American history textbooks. However, the sheer lack of coverage on China makes it difficult to argue that history textbooks alone are capable of shaping an otherizing narrative throughout the time and space of American society and culture. Nevertheless, education still proves to be an important force in constructing and propagating national ideas. Even a slight increase in comprehensive, unbiased coverage of China and American history textbooks has the potential to completely change American perspectives on China in the long term. And that is 14 pages of pseudo intellectualism so oh man i mean i don't know guys um i'm trying to i'm trying to recontextualize this into what i actually see in the classroom again the reason why i'm even bringing this up on this episode to begin with is because you know i wrote this paper when i was a student not thinking that i would ever um be delivering curriculum in front of a classroom to high school students and now that's exactly what i do and so going back to what i mentioned at the beginning it's really easy to theorize these things and talk about all the things wrong about how textbooks are written how curriculum is delivered and blah 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 um, because again, education is something that is really, really easy, idealized. Um, and so you could argue that this paper is very uh, verbose navel gazing because again, if I'm not, again, I'm not a social studies teacher, um, but I think if you were someone who spends their days in and out of the classroom and you're looking at this and you, you probably say something like, what else do you want us to do? This is a very tall ask. You know what else I have to deal with in the classroom? You have to deal with kids who can't read. Um, I'm not even exaggerating when I say this. There's a New York Times article that I'll link to in the show notes. Um, written in 1985, I remember finding this article when I was like, this is unwise Googling of dumb questions, which we're all guilty of, but this is particularly embarrassing. I was literally Googling um, something like, why do American history social studies classes only teach American history or something along those lines. And the first result that kept popping up was this 1985 New York Times article um, talking about, amongst other things, like the inadequacy of, of students understanding American history. So it wasn't even like students are learning too much American history. It was like students don't know anything about American history. And that is a very, very big problem. Um, and it wasn't for the reason of like they're learning other things. Well, it was, um, again, 1985. But I remember very clearly there was a point in the article where um, a teacher or a professor of education had said that it was more useful for high school students to spend their time doing athletics or doing vocational training because they had, quote, their entire lives to learn about history, which is like horrifying to think about, but makes sense, maybe. Uh, if you don't think about it too hard. Um, but anyway, the uh, the article is talking about like, you know, these are all things like things that, that American students should know about American history. Things like when did the Civil War happen? Or um, yeah, stuff like that. Like like really important, really basic stuff that we take for granted. Um, the article was like, why do American students not know any of this? And s the teachers who commented on it were like, well, uh, they don't know how to read they don't know how to read. They can't write. If you can't do, do those basic things, how in the world are you going to get them to understand any history? History is mostly reading. I don't even need to be a social studies teacher for, for me to know that. Like, And so 
imagine that is your baseline, right? And that makes the rest of us who are, you know, floating up high in our, you know, philosophizing cloud of whatever elitism. Um, and we're saying, like, this is what history education looks like because it's so, it matters so much. Um, but on the ground, teachers are saying, like, and I'm sure this is probably still the case to some extent today. Um, teachers are like, hey, we're getting, we're struggling to get kids to be able to read basic sentences. What more do you want us to do? Um, and, and I think that's a very fair point. Um, I think the biggest challenge of education is not necessarily talking about this high level stuff. I think there is, there is value in a paper like the one I wrote when I was 20 years old in college um, that, that, that realizes that there is an urgency in getting this right. Um, history, social studies, civics education matters a whole lot. And we see that we see no better example of that given the current political climate today. And, and so you could constantly make the argument that we have to get this right because it has real life consequences. In this paper alone, it talks about how an entire country's perception of an entire country of 1.3 billion people is, you know, arguably directly affected by how bad a job we did of uh, educating them about that people group. Um, but given the realities of the situation at hand, which is a phrase that I feel like I should put on a bumper sticker at this point um, for this podcast, how do we still manage to achieve those goals? I think it's really difficult um, to do so in a way that really, that, that delivers material in a way that's kind of like, don't you see, um, you know, you cannot hand a student who, like your average student, Howard Zinn's textbook and be like, just read this, you know? Um, or, 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 or anything like that. It's just too much, you know? And, and, and on the one hand, you could, you, yes, you could argue that like, maybe we should expect more from our students. Maybe we should say that like, you know, we are, we're selling them short by saying they cannot, they are not capable of understanding this. We are, by catering to the lowest common denominator, we are selling them short and not, uh, not dreaming enough for them, not setting high enough expectations. Um, they will only achieve to the point in which we believe them. Yes, agreed. Um, but there is a difference between believing in a student and making these things accessible. And I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said before, because if you look at how um, social studies education has evolved um, in, in recent, not even recent years, and honestly for decades, um, there's been a concerted effort to to reframe social studies education in a way that is that contains all of the nuance um, and yet remains accessible to all students. You see no better example of this than how uh, social studies education has developed in uh, communities of color, in urban schools. Um, and because the thing is like, in, in, it almost seems too easy. I mean, you could make that argument. I think it's kind of like a very insensitive argument, but you could make the argument that it's a little too easy to apply that to inner city schools or communities of color because the ramifications of the nuances of history have a direct impact on those communities. You cannot you cannot oversimplify the civil war. Um and, and teach it in a lowest common denominator way uh, without feeling some, at least if you're a decent person, some sense of moral responsibility to the students, to the black and brown students that are literally in your classroom, right? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to say that it's easy, but but it seems like a very logical progression. Um, not hard, not easy to implement at all. And so circling back to what my role is in all of this, again, like the reason why this matters to me, despite me not being a social studies teacher, is by and large because, you know, American history is taught over and over and over again in American schools, despite the fact that American history is only about 300, 300 years long, like baby, baby history compared to most other, most other civilizations. And yet we teach the same 300 years in excruciating detail over and over and over again, um, perhaps as a reaction to the circumstances detailed in that 1985 article where there was just a very depressing lack of knowledge, um, awareness in students about American, about their own history. Um, and so if that is the circumstance, you'd be like, we got to get this straight first before we move on to any other country's history. Um, but, but I think, you know, that is the circumstance at hand and there is a reason for that, right? Like you, if you're going to be a part of a group, if you're going to be part of a country, right? If you're going to be a contributing member of that country in the sense that you will be able to vote, 
again, I cannot, I don't think that can really be overstated. You have to understand where this country co- came from. All of that in, in its truest sense, not just this like, you know, romanticized, you know, underdog story that um, that, that a lot of textbooks tend to kind of paint. Again, with the, with the best intentions, but with, uh, in order to really not have that narrative of the uh, the the underdog uh, American story take over the narrative and oversimplify it. You really have to get into the nuances of it and reality of things makes it hard for that nuance to come out. Um, anyway, right, given that reality, uh, this, this weighs on me because, like I said at the beginning, um, if we're talking about China, right, and Americans' awareness of China and the Chinese-speaking world, I'll include that in there as well, it stands to reason that my classroom right now and my classroom in the future will be the place where students learn about China um, in all of its, all of what China is, right? <laughs> Which is like perhaps an undue burden because China is a very, very, there's a lot to cover. Um, and that's not really my job. Like first and foremost, I think in order to like, you know, history has been like more of my passion than language has. And it's just been a, a gradual evolution um as as my career has grown but but you know like i i considered being a social studies teacher for a while um and then was faced with the reality that social studies teaching positions are like the like unicorns basically and i'd be looking at being even more unemployed that i that i plan on being in the future now um but also it was because i knew that uh, my interest in history really lay within east asian history um and if i were teaching the us i would be teaching a whole lot of american history which i would, wouldn't mind but it's not really my thing and so it just kind of made sense that like um what is the what, what is the space for me to to press into uh, my love for East Asian history and to share that, um, the Chinese classroom makes sense. Uh, Perhaps counterintuitively, because when you think about cultural studies in Chinese language classrooms, um, you know, you think about like, writing in Maobizi, like writing in Chinese calligraphy, um, food, uh, holidays, uh, making paper lanterns, whatever. which is all good and fine. I think there is an importance in that it is kind of like surface level. Oh, I don't want to even say that. that sounds really dismissive. Um, it is somewhat like an, a, a, an aesthetic look at culture, right? It's like kind of your your go to. I think this is very appropriate if you're teaching younger kids, which is, uh, to be honest, where most Chinese classrooms are situated now. Um, but when it comes to teaching cu- culture uh, in my in my middle school and high school class, I think it will almost always naturally veer, not necessarily towards politics and history, um, but towards the people, right? Um, I think this comes up very, very easily when you're talking about language because inherent in the language is the is, is a difference in how people interact um, and, and, and social dynamics. And that stuff is so endlessly fascinating. The kids find that fascinating. I find that fascinating. Um, and it's so easy to talk about within the linguistics. You kind of have to. Um, the reason why this comes up sixth grade right away, why is there two different words for grandma and grandpa? Why, why do one set of grandparents, uh, why are they referred to as outside grandparents? Um, that stuff comes up almost immediately. The, the examples are countless. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily teaching history. Um, but I think it's a really important start to, uh, really, I don't even want to use the word humanizing because I think, I think kids nowadays do a good enough, they're, they're, the kids nowadays are progressive and thoughtful and, and, and not as prone to caricaturizing of people than people of the past. Usually what happens, honestly, um, is that my kids will come in and sometimes talk about how someone in their family said something kind of, you know, like pretended to speak Chinese and said, did you understand me? Um, you know, classic, right? Uh, and then the kids will be like, yeah, that's so, so dumb. And I'm like, agreed you know um so kids nowadays do know better but i think given you know the fact that maybe one one that i can think of for sure travel to china most of them um some of them have traveled to asia most of them have not traveled to asia most of them have not traveled outside of this country um and the interaction that they get with actual real life chinese people is limited to like me um, and then international students at our school, which is fine. It's great that we have them. Most schools don't. Um, but it's also a very limited, very, uh, very specific set of Chinese people that does not define what Chinese people are as a whole. Um, and so 
you know, they know what China is. They know that people live there. They know that it's different. And they know that China is important. And so if something is important, right, and I see this very clearly with my model Congress kids, right? If they, they know that if something is important, there's an issue that's important, you need to have an opinion on it, right? Um, the uh, the truthfulness of that statement, you can we can argue about. But like, um, from their perspective, it's kind of like, if something is important, um, I need to have a point of view on it. And the the level of informedness uh, of that point of view is very much determined by their awareness of uh, of the, the 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 like the authenticity of the information that they're given. Um, and so, if their picture of China cannot come from actually interacting with real life Chinese people, um, and if I'm one of the only Chinese people that they interact with, which is even kind of pushing it, because I feel like, I don't know, I, like, I, I feel much more American than I do Chinese most of the time, especially when I'm in the classroom, um, you know, it's not as if it's my, it's my duty, it's not as if I'm obligated to be the harbinger of all things Chinese to my students so that they don't become ignorant, um, but I think it kind of is, though, because, you know, like, if you have the opportunity to shed light on something or, 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 or carve a, carve a picture, an a more accurate picture of an entire people group into the minds of an impressionable young person, um, you, you're obligated to do a good job with that, I feel. Um, and so, you know, not to give myself more pressure at my job than, than I already do, but, um, as I'm thinking back to this paper, right, I, I remember, again, when I wrote this paper as an undergrad, um, being pretty naive and pretty unaware as to the challenges of teaching, um, I, again, had that perspective that a lot of people have about education and that, like, yeah, I'm demanding a lot from this, but it's too important for you to mess up, um, I, I, I don't think my view on that has changed. I do still think that education is too important for us to mess up, but it's also really hard. Um, and and I think that's where, as a teacher, who when, when your job is to carry out that difficult task, you really need to kind of, um, you know, break it down and, and, and realize how you're going to do it. Um, and realize you can't do everything at once. And so, so I, I don't have an expectation for myself to, to, to communicate the, uh, the, the nuances of U.S. China relations history uh, through my language classes. But I think I am obligated to really press into those conversations when they do come up. Um, and to do so in a way that is, uh, that, that, that takes into full account the ramifications of what I'm saying. It's not just a matter of exposure. Um, it's not just a matter of, and I think this is one thing that a lot of, uh, people get wrong. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's wrong, but like, um, people will say that the reason why we teach culture in Chinese classrooms is so that the kids will be interested or rather, I think intrigued is a better word, um, that they think that Chinese culture is super cool, um, super beautiful, almost exotic. And then that would compel them to want to learn more Chinese to which I'm just like, so you're asking them to basically fetishize Chinese culture in order and, and fall in love with a somewhat artificialized, um, sanitized version of reality. Um, you know, this mythical version of China where like, and this is no joke, I've had, I've heard this from younger kids. I mean, they're younger kids, but I'm just like, this comes from somewhere where people literally thought that like in China, dragons fly in the sky and all the buildings looked like pagodas and had little curly things on the, on the ends of the roofs. Um, there is definite, like, you know, there's some, some work that, that you have to undo, uh, given, I don't know, media portrayal of China, popular portrayal of China. Um, and in those circumstances, you do feel this obligation to kind of, um, do better. Yeah, I think it's really hard to make a compelling case. I think, I think I came into writing this paper, um, expecting that my very, simple conclusion would be schools should offer more Chinese courses, uh, which is unrealistic. I, it's not even as if my high school didn't offer a Chinese course. They did. They had a Chinese history course. No one ever took it though, because um, it was not an honors course. It's not an AP course. It was an elective. And, you know, once you were at a point in high school where you had the time in your schedule to take electives, either you just didn't have to take history class anymore, so you just didn't, or you were taking APs, and the only APs available to you were Euro and uh, U.S. History. US history. Um, so it's not as if there wasn't, it wasn't made available, it just wasn't, there wasn't sufficient interest. Um, and so perhaps this is where things like Chinese class come in, right? 
Uh, we're at a point right now where Chinese language is still a very like hot, um, you know, flashy, popular thing um, for mostly pragmatic reasons because people are like, you know, bi uh, bilingualism is a really sexy thing. Uh, you know, not that it doesn't hasn't, but Chinese in particular, I think, as a language, is a very easy sell for a lot of people, deceptively easy sell. Um, and maybe Chinese history class, not so much yet. Uh, at least not on the level as Chinese language, and so this is kind of a good way, if there ever was one, to, to be a, serve as a vehicle to um, get people to understand China in all of its nuances. This does not mean that, like, again, this does not mean that we're, like, pandering or or we're not doing the exact same thing that, that American history textbooks do to America in that it paints America in a rosy light, um, paints this narrative as America as a hero because, you know, particularly relevant to China now because there is this sort of sense of, like, Almost, I don't want to say it's the same kind of underdog story, but there is definitely this prevailing narrative that um, China has risen from, you know, unspeakably horrible circumstances and has, has risen to become such a, a great world power um, due to its own, you know, strength, whatever, um, which is, again if you think about it, like just another narrative that you have for history, for politics. Um, and so it's tricky to navigate that, to, to balance that carefully, to like, you know, present reality as it is. And it's particularly difficult for me just because, again, I'm not, I'm not Chinese Chinese. Um, but, but really my goal here is, is looking at the, is really, is really informed by the context of what exists now for how Americans understand China. It is, it's it's really trying to not fix things because that's that's way too big of a task for anyone but to but to see where there are deficiencies and how I and my capacity can really can really fill those in um you know and so that kind of makes my work gives 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 my work a level of meaning that it wouldn't have had otherwise had I just stuck to language teaching and then compartmentalized culture studies to just like holidays and food and such um not that those things aren't important, but, uh, but, but yeah, just an important distinction to make. So, all right, I've rambled on for long enough. Um, I need to go to bed because otherwise I think I might just like shave off another 20 years off the end of my life by the end of this weekend, but I hope you enjoyed that. Um, let me know if this is something you kind of like. I think this was a little bit nerdy of an episode and a very gratuitous on my part. I literally spent this episode reading aloud my, my undergrad history paper to you. Um, so, so if you thought that this was awful, let me know. Um, you know how you can let me know? You can follow the podcast uh, social media handles and at me everywhere so um if you haven't done that already if you're on instagram you should follow at bad chinese teacher on twitter it's at bad chinese pot and on facebook it's just search it up bad chinese teacher podcast you'll find all of it there if uh, speaking about feedback it's really helpful for me if you leave a review on apple podcast if you use apple podcast it's right there for you uh hit the five star rating and then also leave me a little note on reviews um just so I can, you know, know that there's an actual human listening to this and, and feeling good about it. So otherwise I just see numbers and that's, you know, very, uh, very soul crushing if you think about it in some ways. Um, if you're looking for me, if you find me endlessly interesting, uh, and want to follow me on social media as well, you can definitely do that. You can find me on Instagram at Patricia Liu, um, on Twitter at Patricia SQ Liu, and you can find my writing at blog.patricialiu.net. So, um, that brings us to the end of today. And I hope you have a good start to your week, and I will see you again next week with the second half of the Model Congress reunion special. It'll be a really, really fun one. Ends off really, really nicely. Um, and so, you know, hope you enjoy that too. All right. Have a good one. 